Zo, de rest van mijn kostenpie. secretion system and you can actually see the two membranes so this is the bacterial double membrane which is the inner, inner and the outer membrane and then if you look very very carefully you can't see it from that distance but there's actually uh, the secretion system is, is over here right? this is a single molecule and then if you combine multiple images you can get uh, a, 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 an image like this okay? it's a bit hard to see now <coughs> on a slide, but, uh, <coughs> so that's 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 the power of um, <coughs> of cryo uh, uh, nowadays. I, oh, I like espresso, but then okay. Um, so one of one of cool things that you can do with EM. So uh, it's single particle, so because it's microscopy, you can only zoom in. And you can look at, at, at individual molecules. Uh, so it's static in the sense that it, because it's cryo, it, you've frozen your sample. It's not crystal water, it's not ice. It's amorphous water. That's important because once you get ice crystals formed, it distorts everything. Um, so you don't really have to purify anything as long as, long as you can locate the, th the thing that you're interested in then uh, you can just zoom in on it. Um, what you often can do with membrane proteins is you can crystallize them in the membrane. So if you just stuff enough protein, membrane proteins together in the membrane, they do exactly what, uh, what normal proteins do in, in 3D, <coughs> but they do it in 2D. Right? So they make a 2D crystal inside the membrane. It's, it's, it's less membrane than protein at that point, you know, because the proteins are stacked together. But as, as long as you get, they're, they're called sort of, uh, I don't know what they call them. I think of rafts, but it's a different thing. Um, hmm? uh, I'm not sure. They have a name for that. Like like a, a section of, of membrane where the protein is crystallized. They have a name for that. Um, but that, but you, you, you can just take an image of that, and then you can do the... Uh, so th what they actually do is you, you take the image of it, and then they actually do a forward and a reverse Fourier transform on that image. And then you get the, uh, the, the combined structure of all the protein molecules in that, uh, in that bit of repetitive uh, 2D crystal. You can do a similar thing for fibers, actually, if you're lucky. Uh, well, a fiber is like a 1D crystal. So if you have a clear enough picture of a fiber, you can actually do it, you can get uh, high resolution uh, data on a single unit of your fiber, protein fiber, uh, by doing the, 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 the Fourier transform trick along the, uh, along the length of the fiber. Um, yeah. And high resolution is possible, but it's still difficult. Okay, so this is one of the early success stories. Uh, the first uh, I think it's the first uh, human uh, membrane protein that was uh, uh, the, the, the structure was solved. And uh, so this is a view of the electron density map. This is uh, a different way of visualizing that. Uh, this was actually already quite old-fashioned in the, in the late 1990s. Uh, but it's still uh, it's just slab, uh, cut slabs of, I, th I think it's wood. could be styrofoam, but I, I think it's wood. Uh, it's a lot of work anyway, so why not make it durable? Um, and um, so you can actually see that uh, the resolution is quite low, right? So these these stacks that are individual helices, sometimes you can't really separate them well, 
Yeah, so they're sort of, so that's the, 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 the limit of the resolution. I think it was, I thought, uh, it's nine angstroms of resolution, right? So that's about the diameter of a helix. So, uh, and these are a few views from like a, a cross section uh, where you can actually, if you squint a bit, you can see that there's a channel here in the middle. Is it too small from the back? You can see it. Uh, and this is when you look from the top, so you see the, the, the sort of the black uh, bits of, of high density uh, at the center of the helices, and then you see the channel in the middle. So lots of useful information, but it's, it's, it's also quite lim limited. Anyway. Um, so um, one step further is actually electron diffraction, where you make a three-dimensional crystal of your protein, but then you do <coughs> exactly like you do with the crystallography. You do the diffraction with electrons. Why would that actually help? Because the electron, the, so the, the, the wavelength of the electron radiation is much lower than what low, it's considerably lower than, than the X-rays. Um, but any idea? You know what the cool thing is about electron radiation? you can actually measure the failures. So the, you, you can really just take the data, do the reverse Fourier transform, no modeling involved. Uh, and, and so you can actually say that the electron density as measured by electron diffraction is the, uh, is, is the experimental data. Yeah, that's different in crystallography. Um, so they did this for uh, uh, the uh, one unit of the tulin uh, fiber protein, alpha beta tulin. Um, so um, that was, uh, and that's already a while ago, <coughs> 20 years. Okay, so uh, this so this is electron diffraction. Um, now back to electron microscopy. So I already had the uh, electron 2D diffraction. <coughs> Uh, this is single particle imaging. This is quite old work that was done in, but I couldn't trace back the people who did it actually. Uh, I got this image from the people in Groningen when I was doing my PhD there. Um, but I, I, I don't remember who it was and I couldn't find back any papers that they might have published on it. So I don't know. But it's about, it's a virus and this is the, uh, the raw image uh, where you select different uh, particles. Uh, you, can, you can sort of see them. Uh, the next step is that you, uh, because you don't, you don't necessarily know in which direction you're looking at them. They might be in different orientations. So you sort them into classes where your um, your your assumption is that the different uh, classes are actually different orientations in the, in the direction that you're looking at them. Uh, then per class you take the average, and then you uh, you try to. Uh, map them onto, so you can actually try to, from the average, you try to determine which irritation you're looking at, then you know how to combine them. And it's actually, again, here you do a forward and a reverse Fourier transform to go from these average images to a 3D image. This is, uh, this is then just different cross sections through the, the reconstructed 3D image. So you can see that the result, this is 20 years, 25 years ago. Uh, the resolution is very low. Nowadays, you can do, you can get much higher resolution here. But you can see that you, well, you see the, the shape of the spherical fibrous capsid. Uh, but you can also see that you actually can identify the individual protein molecules. So these bright spots, there are the individual protein molecules. And you can even <coughs> recognize different uh, hexagonal and pentagon uh, shapes that you have in this. Uh, this particular uh, virus capsule geometry. Okay, um, so that's single particle stuff. If you have, you can do this actually for large complexes, and then uh, there's a trick that's called cryo EM reconstruction, where you get the overall shape of your complex from the cryo EM, um, and then if you're lucky, uh, so this is a. Uh, tail of the of a bacterial phage and uh, so this is actually the shaft that inserts the DNA into the host bacterium that it's infected uh, and this is a whole machinery that that's needed for that and it has uh, I don't remember about 
like 50 or so different kinds of proteins. So some of them in multiple copies, like this one, uh, and, and some of them in only a few copies. Um, and uh, but if you're in, in this case, they had the crystal structure of most of the individual proteins. So then it's really like a jigsaw uh, exercise. So you, you, you know the oval shape of the complex. You know roughly how many of each of the different individual proteins you, you, you need to have in there. And then you have to find out where they go and how they fit together. Yeah. And then there's lots of small things that you have to consider, like or small issues you have to consider, like the, the shape, uh, the structure that you have from the crystal structure might actually not be exactly the same shape that, that the protein has when it's in this complex. Yeah, because then it might actually, because it's interacting with different proteins around it, it might actually adapt its shape to that. Okay, this is relatively recent work, 2010. Um, and they're doing similar things with the uh, the, um, the type 3 secretion system that I just showed you. That, that's in the book. Okay. Um, this is this is my part on the IUM. Are there any questions about that? No. Okay. Then we go on to NMR. Um, as I said, so. The, the EM is the most direct way to get structural information because it's really microscopy. Uh, X-rays is, is, is indirect in the way that I've already explained. <coughs> NMR, I also already sort of mentioned how that, how that works. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail right now. Um, the, the trick is that uh, some atomic nuclei have what's called in quantum physics a spin. And the spin is like is magnetic, um, and if you put that in a, uh, in a magnetic field, there's an energy difference between the two different, well, depending on which nucleus you're looking at, it's two, three, or five different states. Uh, the ones that we're looking at have two different states. Uh, and this energy difference corresponds to radiation. Yeah, so the, 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 the difference in energy between the two states corresponds to a certain uh, frequency of electromagnetic radiation. In this case, uh, it's, it's, it falls in the in the radio frequency uh, band of about uh, it's, it's typically about 100 megahertz. Depends on the electric field. Uh, sorry, the magnetic field that you apply. The stronger the magnetic field, the bigger the energy gap. So the lower the, the so the higher the frequency. Um, so this is how this is the the, the, mm, the signal that we use. And the trick that we use to get any structure information out of that is that you can have this energy transferred not just between the, the emitter and the receiver that's from your NMR machine, but also from one nucleus to the other. They, 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 they can resonate with your recording, but they can also resonate with each other in different ways. And you can set up your experiment in different ways to have this, resonation, this resonance go through chemical bonds in different ways or through space. So if it goes through chemical bonds, then it's, it, it's going to be sensitive to the angles. So you're, you can measure actually dihedral angles uh, with this, with this way, way quite directly, which is, a, I think, is really cool. Uh, and you can also measure distances between atoms in quite uh, indirectly. So the atoms that are actually sensitive here are primarily the hydrogens that have a spin of themselves. Um, uh, but you could, there's also isotopes of nitrogen and carbon that have a magnetic spin that don't occur uh, a lot naturally. So if you, you can actually make very expensive proteins by growing your, uh, your, your E. coli on medium with uh, um, is it carbon-13 and nitrogen, what, well, particular isotope really expensive glucose, uh, but then you get the expensive protein that's, uh, that actually gives you a lot more, because you can not only measure the distance between uh, the, the hydrogen atoms, but also hydrogen to nitrogen and hydrogen to carbon, carbon to carbon, carbon to nitrogen, uh, and so on. Okay, so, uh, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So if you then, uh, so you get different uh, different atoms will actually <coughs> resonate at different frequencies. I already told you that this uh, so the frequency depends on the gap between the two states. <coughs> um, and that depends on the magnetic field. So you put it in a big magnet in your NMR machine, but in addition to that, uh, all the other uh, nuclei in your protein also, have, the, the, the electrons also have uh, uh, a magnetic influence on each other. So depending on where the atom is in your protein, it will feel a slightly different local uh, magnetic field. Uh, this results in what's called a uh, chemical shift and that makes that the, all the hydrogen atoms in your protein do not resonate at exactly the same frequency which would make it very hard to get any structure information out of it yeah, because then you're looking at all the hydrogen atoms at the same time um, but the uh, it's too long that since I, I've actually done this in my PhD but uh, so I think Maybe somebody knows. The, the, the different, so like uh, um, 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 aromatic side chain hydrogens go in one area, polar uh, side chains go in a different area. Backbone goes in a certain area, and the fatty bond goes in a certain area. So uh, they, they're spread out, and then the local, there's also local differences, so they spread out even in two bit more. Um, yes, that's the other thing that I wanted to mention. Where? If you're talking about your protein system, where are most? Where do you find most hydrogens? Side chains. Yeah. Side chains. Yeah, they have quite a few hydrogens. Do, do how many hydrogens in the background? Only one. Yeah, yeah two. Well, two on the on the car, on the shelf, huh? the, on the nitrogen and on the shelf. So that's one more. Okay, so that's your protein. But I was I was talking about the protein system. Where are the most hydrogens in the protein system? On the surface, right? Water. You don't have a dry protein. Yeah. Well, you can actually do powder in a bar. That's a different story. <laughs> um, uh, in the water, yeah, 95% or so of your protein solution, 95% uh, of, the, of the hydrogens are actually in the water. Uh, so if you just put the water, uh, uh, then you're just, it's, it's similar to the, the direct beam in the crystallography. You're just see seeing uh, the, the ir irrelevant stuff, right? So you're just observing the water. Um, so you can't do that in water. What, what you do is you, you, you use deuterated water, D2O, which is again expensive. Um, but the deuterium nucleus doesn't have a spin, so it's invisible. Yeah, it's, so it's like it's like the water isn't transparent for NMR, but the D2O is. Yeah. So it's only a window that's transparent, which makes sense. Um, then there's there's chemistry that that's playing tricks on you. So there's two there's two protons in the in the background, right? Carbon proton and the nitrogen proton. The nitrogen proton actually exchanges with water. So if you put your protein in deuterium water, then it quickly exchanges with the deuterium. And since there's so much water and so little protein, you just lose it. Okay, so in NMR, you can't observe the nitrogen, so the backbone hydrogen. You can't observe any of the nitrogen hydrogens, which is why it's so cool that there's actually a isotope of nitrogen that we can actually measure, because then we, we still get those distances to the nitrogen. Okay. That's enough about the details. So the, uh, the other problem is, uh, I said that, that they, they all resonate at different <coughs> frequencies. So that may be strictly true. Uh, but uh, these, these peaks that you get from the resonance, they have a width, and they overlap. Yeah? So you can see that here in a, in a one-dimensional spectrum of ubiquity, which is only 76 angstrom, uh, angstrom, sorry, 76 uh, amino acids. Um, uh, you, ca you can't see as many peaks as there are hydrogens in these proteins, right? so they're they're overlapping. So uh, too much overlap, and but fortunately we can actually do uh, two-dimensional experiments, and uh, this is actually already complicated ones. So you can do uh, a spectrum where the the 
the resonance energy is absorbed by the hydrogens in your protein, and then you observe the emission from, it's not a fine emission, you observe the resonance through the nitrogens. Um, and you can do the same from the hydrogens to the, to the, to the carbons. And now suddenly you have a two-dimensional space on which to find the different um, proteins. Yeah. And then you have, in, usually you have enough resolution for small proteins to, uh, to solve them in 2D. If that doesn't work, you can actually do a triple, which is like a 3D experiment, where the, so the energy is transferred from a hydrogen to another hydrogen to a nitrogen, and that's what you do. And, and, and I'm not going to go through all the details of how you do that, but you can, you can basically encode the signal in the signal of your, that you're measuring. You can encode the information of all these three, two or three axes of frequency, uh, frequencies. Okay. Um, I already mentioned the chemical shifts. Um, the other thing is that what you need to uh, do is actually find out who is on which frequency, because they don't have, they don't come with numbers. If they're not sequential. Now in, in the crystallography, in the electron density, then residue one comes first, and then residue two comes second, because it's a three-dimensional arrangement of stuff, right? So the protein chain has to go through that. Uh, that's not true in the spectrum. Yeah? Residue one might resonate at a different frequency as two but they don't have to be in the same order. So the trick is to actually make use of what I already mentioned, that you can transfer the energy uh, from one nucleus to the other through your chemical bonds. And here you can see, so you can actually have, uh, so the energy comes in via uh, a hydrogen uh, on the C alpha of tyrosine 12, and they can, you can actually observe that it's transferred to uh, the, the carbon of that one, and then it goes to the uh, C alpha of isoleucine protein. And that's how you trace the connectivity through your uh, through the dots on your spectrum. Um, and, uh, and then it goes from 13 to 14. Yeah, so that's how you, you find out who is on which frequency. And then if you know that, then you can start measuring the angles and the distances. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, that's enough here. So then a two-dimensional spectrum, this is a uh, uh, two-dimensional hydrogen spectrum. Uh, it's, so th these different ways of measuring have different names. This is cosy correlation spectroscopy, which means that the, the, the energy goes through the bonds. Uh, and here you see the peaks of a valine where uh, this is the cross peak between the alpha hydrogens and the beta hydrogens of the valine, and this is the cross peak between the beta and the gamma hydrogens of the valine. Yeah, so you have the, the valine side chain, with, which has, uh, well, it has the, the alpha carbon and then two side chains, the two, two, sorry, two, no, no, three, just two, two gammas. No? Sorry, all right, I'll, I'll draw this. <laughs> Oh, which atoms in the backbone? Three atoms in the backbone. Which which one? Are they? <coughs> hmm? And the alpha, C C O carbonyl, yeah. And then oh, and around the space already. Yeah? So you have a C beta, and then you have in the valine you have two C gammas. They're chemically similar, so they'll end up in the same frequency in the spectrum. And so we can only see all the C beta, C beta sorry, all the C gamma uh, hydrogens in one go. You can't really distinguish it too much. Uh, and then, uh, so then there's a, here's the peaks for the threonine, where you have uh, beta to gamma and, oh yeah, it's only beta, sorry, beta to gamma, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay, uh, it's all about the details, but this just gives you an idea of what these spectra are. This is only a part of the spectrum, and this was actually uh, only for a small peptide. This is the one I did to my PC. Um, okay, so uh, this is what I already said. Sometimes if you have a bigger protein, this is nitro, uh, nitro reductase, 
uh, it has 217 residues. This is a 2D spectrum of that. And here you can see that there, there are too many uh, peaks in 2D. So to get a good uh, resolution of individual peaks, you actually need to go to uh, three-dimensional experiments. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, the other way in which you can actually get signal out of this is so the, these these correlations are actually sensitive to the angles. Uh, you can set up the experiment in a different way, uh, where you uh, where the energy is transferred just through space, and then it depends on the distance between the two. And the effect, this this transfer effect, is called the nuclear overhauser effect, and and the, uh, the, the the experiment is known as NOSI, uh, which stands for nuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy. Um, and the the, tens the density. Uh, varies with 1 over r to the sixth. Uh, that's a very so gravity is 1 over r squared. Um, yeah, um, so that's that's but that already drops off quite quickly. Magnetism is uh, is it 1 over r squared as well? Yeah. So if you have two magnets at a meter distance, you don't feel anything. No? If you have them close, suddenly they snap. That's 1 over r squared. Uh, 1 over R6, that means that you only measure very close distances. And as, as soon as they, they, the atoms move apart, typically more than five angstroms. And that's not a lot. If you have two carbon atoms and you move them apart just so much that you can add a third one in between, that's already more than five angstroms apart. So three carbons in a row, the, the outer two carbons are already too far away to see. Okay, so um, that has an effect that if you have two, can you see the difference in conformation here? This is not really a protein. This is called a trip cage, I think, if you remember correctly. But if you have a floppy bit that has two conformations in your molecule, where it can be down and then, then you get a, a short distance over here, or it can be up, you get a short distance over there, you'll actually measure both the short, both of the short distances. But you won't measure, so you measure the average, but the average will be biased to <coughs> short distances. Yeah? So you'll measure this short distance and that short distance. Why is this a problem? Because it will end up in the middle. Well, it, it, you can't, if you put it in the middle, then you've got both distances wrong. So the only thing you know about the structure are the distances that you measure. Right? So from the distances, you can reconstruct the structure. If you have enough distances between points, you can reconstruct the, the, the uh, slight triangulation. Right? You can reconstruct their, uh, their relative positions. But then if, if this atom has to be close to that and close to that, at least that's what your data tries to tell you, right? then you either put it in the middle and, and you get them both wrong, or you might actually uh, change the location of this loop. Then, oh, then they probably should be closer together. You, from the experiment, you can't know that this is moving back and forth. There's, there's other tricks you can do to actually get some idea of that. But this is a, this is one of the things. So you will have to be aware of that when you're going from your distances to your uh, to your structural calculation. That uh, the, the 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 averages that you measure, you measure averages all the time because you're measuring the solution of. of, of uh, some fraction of, of Avogadro's number of, of total molecules. Um, so uh, you'll, you'll have the average of, of all those, but it's biased very strongly towards the short distances. Yeah, so uh, not having two atoms close together, uh, while you do measure uh, a signal between them, might not, have, might not be a problem. OK. Um, and this, I uh, have a. Uh, like this to show. <laughs> okay. But the, 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 so either of these are a good solution. Uh, but but uh, if you if you just rely on your distances, you might actually put it in the middle. Okay. Um, now, the next thing is you may remember what I said about the water. You can't do NMR with water. You need heavy water, D two O, water. Um, and I already mentioned so the. 
the, in chemical terms, this hydrogen is slightly acidic, so that means it can come off, and it will come off, and it will exchange with with uh, the hydrogen in your water. Yeah. So you'll get uh, an H3O plus here temporarily, and then another hydrogen from another water will reattach to the to the black one nitrogen. Yeah. That's just just normal. Um, uh, um, Acid-base equilibrium that you have in, in protein chemistry. Now, if you put the protein in, D, in D2O, the, the the proton will detach, and most likely, because most of the water is D2O, you won't get a proton back, but you get a deuteron back. So you lose the signal of these backbone nitrogen. So if you take, uh, which protein is this? SPH15. I haven't looked up recently what that is. Um, you put this protein in D2O, you take the spectrum after 20 minutes. Uh, it is, you already don't see uh, um, peaks for most of the hydrogens. So which ones would you have lost already after 20 minutes? Why would you not lose all of them? Yeah, or, or more precisely, if you think about a helix, where is this? Where is this hydrogen in the helix? Inside. Yes, well, yeah, it depends on how you define inside, but it's it's hydrogen bonded with a carbon you'll see to one turn up or down. Yeah? So this one, is, for this one, it's not so easy to have. It won't actually exchange with the water, as long as it's hydrogen bonded to the other carbon. Now, the, the, the thing is, if you store this one, the, the sample in the freezer, and you get it back out three days later, you put it in the NMR, you see much fewer peaks. And if you repeat it after three weeks, you see even fewer peaks. And then if you do it again after three months, you don't see any peaks anymore. Mm -hmm. But you can do the, the nosy experiment to measure all the distances, and you still have a fold of protein. You measure all the short distances that, that go with the helical conformations here. You measure the short distances between the two adjacent helices, and so on. You measure these short conflicting distances between this part that's still uh, flexible. Yeah, so the overall structure, the average structure that you have in your sample has not changed. <coughs> but you've lost all the signal on your uh, on your amide, your uh, uh, protons, your nitrogen protons in the background. And why is that? How can you explain that? And it's, it is not just true for this small protein. Uh, it's, it's, I think this is actually a, a bigger protein than, than the one I'm showing you. But this, this is true for any protein that anybody has ever stuck in an NMR machine. What happened? How can you exchange these buried uh, hydrogen bonded protons that are in the middle of the protein structure? You can't, right? So how can you explain the experiment then? What must have happened in between? Measuration. Yeah, but you can still measure the the signals that go with the folded structure. Does it sometimes switch between folded and unfolded? Yeah. So they do denature, but den if you talk about denaturing of a protein solution, that usually means that it's irreversible, right? Yeah, it unfolds, it aggregates, it's lost. So it does. So the individual molecules denature, if you will, they unfold, but they also refold. Yeah? And that just goes on all the time, even if you store it in the fridge. Uh, well, not if you store it on ice. Well, I'm not sure. Probably will, will still go if you store it on ice. It will be very, very slow. But uh, no, but just in a, like at 4 degrees uh, Celsius. And then uh, it's still liquid water, uh, and it still goes on. You don't want to store it at 30 degrees, because if you get a bacterial infection in your sample, then they will eat up the protein. Yeah? But 4 degrees is fine. Okay, um, 
So this is this is cool because this is very direct and irrefutable <laughs> experimental evidence that protein structures are not static, but that they unfold and refold all the time, all the time, yeah. all the time. Can't emphasize this enough. Right. Um, now, these are some numbers that you need for, for like a reasonable size proteins. I don't want to go into the details there because we've just officially run out of time. Um, the, the other thing, so in, I, I mentioned that in, so we have the nitrogen exchange experiment that I just showed you that, that is very direct evidence for uh, flexibility, right? Um, so much more to say about that. Um, uh, and then in crystallography we have the B factors that tell us something about the dynamics. There's another way in which we can get some idea of dynamics from, from our NMR, is because if you have all your distances and then you start calculating your structures, you'll find some parts of the protein that are very well defined, a little bit like I explained for the crystallography, and then some parts where you have fewer distances um, and, and there's much more freedom to move. So that could mean two things. And it's probably a combination of those two. It could either be just a lack of data, because a loop is, gonna, is not going to be close to many other parts of the protein structure. So you measure few distances. Uh, but uh, it's probably in combination with the fact that this loop is also going to be flexible. So you're going to measure an average over a couple of different distances, and then it sort of smears out. Um, and, and you can actually look at line shapes. So actually, the the resonance uh, the resonance frequency of moving atoms is also less well defined. So you get actually broader resonance peaks. So you, there's also other uh, uh, direct evidence for the mobility of atoms that you get from the uh, from, the, from the, sorry not from the crystal from the uh, NMR data. Okay. Then a few minutes for the other spectroscopic methods, uh, because uh, sometimes you can't crystallize or your protein is too big for NMR. Most of the time you do the, the spectroscopy when you actually need to have detailed information about some part of the structure. Um, and what is cool about, um, I'm just going to skip one slide and come back to it in a minute. Uh, what's cool about, let's say, the, the regular spectroscopy is that it can be, you can do very, very fast measurements. So you can do femtoscale spectroscopy measurements that allow you to actually track chemical reactions as they happen in your protein, uh, in your enzyme. Uh, or you can actually monitor folding and unfolding uh, transitions. If you heat up your protein sample, you can, with, with spectroscopy, follow how certain uh, uh, Certain absorptions change as a, a residue that was in the inside of your protein molecule in the folded state now becomes exposed to the uh, water and it changes its, its, its spectroscopic uh, um, properties. The other thing is that uh, this is again uh, crystallography, so not crystallography, it's x ray or neutrons. Actually, you can do it with, with electrons as well. You can do scattering. And uh, it does really like physical scattering. It's like playing billiards, uh, but then with blindfolds, and you don't know what you're shooting at. But if you if you know where the balls are hitting the wall, and you do that often enough, you you can get a uh, a rough um, um, uh, vision of the shape of the thing that you are shooting at. This is almost exactly what happens in the experiment. It doesn't really matter what you're shooting with, as long as it's small enough to, to that it. It's sensitive to the small um, surface features of the model. Uh, the cool thing about this is, un unlike NMR or crystallography, it, it works in solution in real time, uh, and it works on huge protein complexes. So if you if you can't get it in your in the cryo EM for whatever reason, uh, or you want to observe it in a different condition, then you want to observe it in a liquid state and not in the cryo state, then you can do these small angle scattering experiments. And it's used uh, a lot for, for uh, protein complexes um, because just the shape of the complex gives you a lot of information about where the individual proteins might be. If you know, certainly if you know something about the shape of the individual proteins. Yeah? Uh, this method, don't you need to hit like 
at the exact same spot to get like a, a similar scatter pattern? Or can uh, you imagine that, that the scatter pattern would be totally different if you hit it from another angle, for example? Yes, so uh, no, you, uh, you can actually, uh, but it, it's not a very precise measurement. Uh, so you can actually get the shape information just from enough random scattering events. Okay, um, there's some example of, uh, um, what is this again? Uh, this is uh, infrared spectroscopy uh, on details of the chemistry, but I'm not going to go into detail there uh, right now. And this is just a summary of the methods that I've been explaining. Uh, crystallography, uh, uh, which is high resolution, basically no size limits, although Big complexes don't crystallize easily. Um, electron microscopy does single particles, well, works well for membranes. NMR works in solution, you can get uh, information on dynamics. And the other spectroscopy uh, methods, they can do very, very short time resolutions. Uh, and they can be very sensitive, but only to particular details. You can't, you can't really get enough data to <coughs> the whole uh, <coughs> detail of your protein structure, just a few distances. <coughs> or a few distances. <coughs> with that, I'm done for today with you, at least for the lecture side. Uh, and I'll see you in a few minutes. In the Unless there are still questions. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, just a second, I'm going to turn off the recording. Yep.